a universally quantified statement is really difficult to satisfy. It's a combination of a huge line of and statements. So every single statement would have to be true in that long list of ands in order for the universally quantified statement to be true. It's like a truth table with only one row that has true, 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 true in it. Every other situation is going to be false. On the other hand, an existentially quantified statement is much easier to satisfy. All we need is one of the little individual or statements to evaluate to true in order for the big whole statement to be true. I could have a list of a whole bunch of non-flying birds and just include one bird that could fly and the statement some of the birds in this set could fly would be true even if the majority of them cannot fly. So universally quantified statements are incredibly difficult to satisfy but existentially quantified statements are much easier. And that's really coming back to this idea of truth tables with ands versus ors. In fact, if you keep going with this example, you can start to see that universally quantified statements and existentially quantified statements are something of opposites of one another. So let's return to our example with the birds. If we wanted to make the statement, all birds in this set can fly, but we were wrong, somebody was saying, that's not true. In order to say it's not true that all birds in the set can fly, what we would really be saying is there's at least one counterexample. There exists a bird in that set that cannot fly. So roughly stated, if we continue with that example, x is my set of birds, p of x is my statement that the bird can fly, the negation of the statement, all birds can fly, is logically equivalent to the statement, there exists a bird in the set, such that it is not true that the bird can fly. And so this is a general rule for negating a universally quantified statement. And there's an equivalent rule I'd like you to think about, about negating an existentially quantified statement. So this is an area of logic where you want to be particularly mindful as you go forth into the world, because occasionally people go too far to extremes when they're trying to negate quantified statements. For example, we know from common sense, since this is an example we're very familiar with, that if somebody is saying it is not true that all birds can fly, that person is not saying that no birds can fly. That person is saying there are some birds that cannot fly. And part of the reason you can convince yourself that the opposite of all is not none, is that a statement regarding none is also a universally quantified statement. So if you keep in mind that both all statements and none statements are both universally quantified, and that the opposite of a universal quantifier really needs to be an existential quantifier and vice versa, Hopefully that can help you not make that kind of mistake. So just to keep up with this example one step further, the statement that no birds can fly would be the statement that for every bird that I'm considering, it is not true that that bird can fly. And as you can see with that written down, that's a universally quantified statement. So it's too strong of a flip from all to none that's not the way that we negate universal quantifiers. Now the very last thing that I'd like to cover is just a silly example and a warning if you get to the point where you start combining quantifiers. Because once we start combining alls and exists, it starts to matter the order in which we place those statements and we want to read our statements left to right thinking about them in that way. 
And there was this really cool cartoon that stressed this that I'd like to take. I really would like to take something that was meant to be a lighthearted joke and turn it into something academically precise, which is a horrible thing to do, but it really illustrates the point that I'm trying to get across here. Let's say instead of a single variable, I have a statement that takes input from two different variables, and I've called them x and y here. So statement p of x, y is the statement that people x and y are soulmates. In this cartoon, the character says, I believe there is one true soulmate for every person. And Dilbert says, he must be very busy. And she says, well, I really meant one per person. Your way would be stupid, right? So the idea was what she meant to say was that for each person, there exists another person for which those two people are soulmates. And in other words, for each person right here, there exists another element in this set, and it's not really written this way, but this y, as it is with lines like y is equal to mx plus b, it could really depend on the thing that came before it, namely the x. So each time we choose a different x here, this little y over here could actually be a function of that x and could change. And statement p of this x, that y, could be true. This statement right here would be equivalent to what she meant to say. For each person, there is a soulmate for that person. However, Dilbert interpreted the statement with the quantifiers reversed. There exists this one person in this set, so that for all remaining elements in the set, person singular x and every single different y needs to be true. So this is stating that there is a unique person in this set x such that no matter what the y is, that person is their soulmate. And that's a very dramatically different statement than the first and is the source of misunderstanding in this cartoon. So when you start to encounter combined quantifiers, Make sure you're reading from left to right with the proper interpretation. And when you're writing down statements that need combined quantifiers, make sure you're thinking about the order in which you make your choices and the order in which you need to place your quantifiers.